Hello, my name is Brent Galt, and I'm an Associate Professor of Music Education at the Indiana University Jacobs School of Music. In this presentation, I'd like to talk a little bit about Jerome Bruner's modes of representation and how that can serve as a model for active music learning in childhood. Jerome Bruner is a psychologist who we associate with many different ideas in the educational community. Among these ideas are his idea related to discovery learning, his idea related to the spiral curriculum and the development of spiral curriculum when planning instruction. Um, in addition to these two ideas, the idea I'd like to talk about today is first described in his 1966 publication, Towards a Theory of Instruction. In this publication, he describes a progression of learning that moves through three stages, or three modes in which we represent learning. The first is representing material actively, or what he refers to as inactive or action-based learning. From this inactive or action-based learning, Bruner would say that we move to a next stage where we represent material through general pictures or graphs. And he labels the second stage as iconic or image-based learning. From that stage, he says the final stage that we learn, that we move to when we're learning new material is one in which we learn through complex symbol systems or what he refers to as symbolic or code or symbol-based learning. Bruner's three modes of representing learning have been applied to many different areas of education. What would they look like, however, if we applied them to music education in general and specifically to music in childhood? Well, if we were applying these modes of representation to music in childhood in the inactive stage, children might experience a musical concept or idea through musical activity. This could include singing, playing an instrument, moving in a way that represents conceptual properties, or creating something that also represents those creative, those conceptual properties actively. From that inactive musical learning, we would move into the iconic stage. In the iconic stage, we might illustrate these same concepts that we've just represented actively in some kind of graphic way. For example, gen general contour maps that show the contour of a melody, pictures that represent the rhythmic duration of a piece, or using pictures to represent specific formal sections. After representing these in general pictures or graphs, we move into the symbolic association phase. In this phase, we would associate those icons that we've already used to specific symbol systems, in this case, notation or musical markings that have specific meanings beyond the pictures that are represented on the page. The idea of experiential learning and moving from an active learning to theoretical understanding is certainly not new in, music, in childhood music settings. If you look at the common approaches that teachers utilize when teaching music to children, m most of these advocate musical experience that eventually leads to theoretical understanding. With teachers who utilize a pro an approach inspired by the philosophy of Zoltan Kodai, singing and folk material become the vehicle through which children first experience music and then learn musical concepts and ideas. With ORF, channels such as speech, creativity, use of instruments, and movement are the inactive channels that eventually lead to musical understanding. Emile Jacques Dalcroze and his idea of rhythmic movement and eurythmics, a term that he coined, this rhythmic movement provides the active channel through which children can first experience music and then eventually find the conceptual ideas that lie underneath that. In addition to these three common approaches, teachers who advocate constructivism or discovery learning would also use inactive approaches as the children in their classrooms construct meaning from their surroundings and from their peers and have this meaning eventually translate into theoretical or conceptual music ideas. So what specifically would this look like in a music classroom? Well, there are many different ways to envision this approach, but here's one possible idea. 
Let's use the tune Hot Cross Buns, a very common tune used in many general music classrooms. For this particular example, I'd like to use Hot Cross Buns to teach steady beat and rhythmic duration. If I wanted a, ch a children's music classroom to learn these ideas, the first thing I would probably have them do is sing with me and keep a beat. So let's do that now. Feel free to sing along. Hot cross buns, hot cross buns, one a penny, two a penny, hot cross buns. So after we did that and felt the beat, the next thing I'd want them to do is understand the difference between that steady beat and the rhythmic duration of the text. So I might have them sing again as they actively feel the rhythm of the words. Hot cross buns, hot cross buns, one a penny, two a penny, hot cross buns. After that inactive experience, I would want to somehow associate those inactive activities that we did to some kind of iconic representation of both beat and rhythmic duration. If you look at the next slide, what you're going to see are white boxes. These boxes represent the steady beats in the song. So as an iconic activity, what I might do next is have children sing while either I or another child points to those boxes and we keep the beat together. Hot cross buns, hot cross buns, one a penny, two a penny, hot cross buns. From that point, I would want to find a way to iconically represent the rhythmic durations that we find in that song. So I might show a picture that looks like this. As you can see in this photo, what we've done is kept the white boxes. The white boxes represent any place where we have one sound on a beat. The brown boxes that are smaller represent any place where we have two sounds on a beat. And the blue boxes represent two beats worth of sound or longer sounds that happen within the song. To give a chi the children a chance to look at this iconic representation, I would have them sing and tap the rhythm again as I pointed to this picture so that they can associate what they're doing with this iconic representation of the song. Now eventually I'm going to want to translate what the, you see on the screen to actual musical notation so that they can read the rhythm from notation. And so at some point I would need to convert my white box to a quarter note, my two brown boxes to two eighth notes, and my longer blue box to a half note. Once we did this, children would be able to see the actual rhythmic notation for hot cross buns and sing as they looked at it and tap the rhythm. Hot cross buns, hot cross buns, one a penny, two a penny, hot cross buns. So while this is not the only possible way that you can envision applying Bruner's model of modes of representation to a music classroom, it's one example of how this could be applied. I think Bruner's model is a nice example for music in childhood because it's a model that's known well within the greater educational community that still advocates the active, artful music making that we want to see in all of our children's classrooms.